Cool. Uh, hi. Um, last before lunch, please rise and shake your bodies for a while so you get some more, you know, a little bit more blood into your brains and everything to listen. And, you know, really try to stretch a little bit. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's been some great speeches before me. I really enjoyed the talks. Um, I'm going to talk about the web, I'm going to talk about time, and I'm going to talk about the web's spatial constructs and how we have been affected by them and, and what has been going on. Um, I'm going to do it sort of in two, two parts. It's going to be sort of based on a chronological uh, way of ideas that we most of us have, most of us have been you know, a part of during our own lifetimes. Um, but before I start, I often um, want to take a stand just to you know, know where I stand and how I see things. And I often start up talking about technology. And um, I'm not a tech guy. I don't know anything about technology. I can't write a piece of code or uh, I can't you know, uh, mold together those kinds of compounds. But I, um, I have a thing about technology that it's a lot of people develop new technologies uh, based on the technology should be developed for itself. As it's some of have a self-purpose, but for me that is just nonsense. Um, for me, it doesn't matter how many cell towers or you know wires we lay out around this world. If there is not two people on each side of the wire, which can actually interact and, and engage and socialize over those wires. Um, the other part I want to take a stand on is always information as well, because um, it's an important tool that I'm working with and a lot of people probably in this audience as well. For me, information in its basic form is always good. There is nothing in information that could harm us or be bad. Uh, it's almost always the opposite. We um, have a tendency to experience stories or events and happenings and the pieces that miss out, I sort of, you know, imagine seeing it as a sort of a puzzle, you know, this Friday night, um, uh, Cal and Lisa walked out, I don't really know what happened. So me as a human being, I have a very good uh, way of, you know, filling out the pieces that are missing myself if I do not get the own information to me. And there is where all the, you know, the shit chat and all those kinds of uh, things come up, they actually did that, or they did this, and, and so on. But that is just the lack of information, not, not um, the problem of, of it being true or not. Because we can handle all stuff out there. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. When I was three years old, um, I live here in Malmo, uh, one of my best friends had to move to Indonesia. So he he was just at the same age as me, he was three years old. He moved with his family to Indonesia, and I rang him up after he'd been there um, about a week, and I called him, and you know, we tried to start talking to each other. It went like this, I said, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I was three years old. You know, my, my time frame for sitting still wasn't that huge. It took like seven, eight, nine seconds something before he responded. And you know, after 20 seconds, I just, mom, I don't want to talk anymore. And I hang up the phone. But I still, you know, I really liked my friend. Um, so we kept on trying out new stuff. Uh, and one of the things that we used was this amazing, this was from the postal service. This was a really new high-tech thing that we used. Uh, it's called Yudbrev, or sound uh, cards, uh, which we sent. Um, it was based on the fact that I went on for 10 minutes in a row, just talking, singing songs, blah, 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 you know, in 10 minutes. You put it into an envelope, you post it all around the globe. Three weeks later, uh, my friend in Indonesia received it, he listened to it, and he turned it around and played in sort of like an answer, which was more based on new songs and other stuff, and we went on. And then he posted back. Um, everything to try to socialize in a way with our 
you know, place or time didn't really matter. Um, moving on, when I was uh, a little bit older, around 10 years old, my mother worked for a party uh, here in Malmo, and it was election time. So she, she received her first phone, you know, her first mobile phone, I should say. Uh, maybe I should start saying, I just love this footage, it's amazing. This is an Ericsson commercial, sort of from 89 or something. We're really trying, you know, just look at it, how they're trying to push the mobility. You know, there's a great Volvo in the left, and it has a big antenna on top of it, and, you know, he's out in the middle of nowhere, and they even got an airplane in there to really tell this is mobile. You know, you can talk from wherever to whomever. Um, but anyhow, she got this phone, and it was my first, you know, experience, I think all of you, have went through this. It was the first time where I changed my behavior due to a you note know, to technology. Because before, I have always called to my mother's work or called my mother at home. It was two specific places that I called. So I lift up the, the phone and I rang, and if I came to her work, I always ended up in the reception, and I said, you know, how are you to the receptionist, and I want to talk to mommy. And when she got this phone, all of that shifted, because now I didn't call you know, a place, I didn't call home or works, so I didn't have to start by saying, you know, how are you? But I started phrasing, what? Like we do, or where are you? I started saying, where are you? And this was you know, a, a slight shift, it's small, but still it's, it's quite big, and I think we all in this room can you know, feel and, and say that we went through the same thing. It's interesting how we change our behaviors due to these new technologies. Um, and so we, we moved on. Um, I started to interact somewhere around 96, 97 with my first computer. It was called a multimedia computer uh, because it contained all those different kinds of media. It was text. It was video, sound, and images. It could do all those kinds of things to where we had 10 different kinds of stuff uh, to do just one thing before. And it was amazing. Uh, I think multimedia was a you know, good word to it. Uh, a lot of people started working as multimedia consultants and were talking about how this will change you know, our lives and our way. But somewhere around 2000, something pretty bad happened. Um, you know, the bubble burst. We had a lot of companies getting a lot of money, developing new technologies that the world wasn't really ready for. Not yet, at least. But I want to retell uh, a stuff that Jeff Bezos says very good in a TED Talk, where he talked about the metaphor which we had back in 2001 for the web and for the internet. And we saw it sort of like back then as a gold rush. Everyone went to San Francisco, to the you know, west coast of, of the States, and you know, they started digging this gold called the internet, but in 2001, just as you know, the last century, the gold somewhere ended, and there were not more pieces, and people you know, lost all the money that they put into those great ventures. But sitting here today, we cannot you know, communicate with the world of the internet or the web. So it, you know, we're sitting here sort of with the answer that it's, it didn't die, you know, the goal didn't end it. So we need sort of like a new metaphor for what actually happened. And what Jeff Bezos says is that this is just based on what we did when we drew light. Because back in the 1850s, 1860s, people were out, you know, digging in the dirt, drawing those lines and putting up lights. That was, you know, the only use we had of electricity. We didn't know what it was for. for. So we, we just used it, and it wasn't strange that the first kind of applications that you saw using this, not the internet then, but the light, was of course, you have to, this is actually a toaster, a 1904 toaster. So when you had to plug it in, of course, you had to go up on the table, you know, screw down the light bulb, take your toaster and screw it back in. It was the only you know, inter interface that we had to this light technology. There were no two holes in the wall where you could just plug in a, a, a charger or a connector. And I think it's a good metaphor for saying that, okay, we haven't seen all the applications yet for what the web will bring or what it will do to us. After it burst, um, people were sort of 
completely confused. So they didn't know what they weren't going to tell or talk about. What this was, you know, what is this new thing? So they just, you know, started throwing out this uh, new word. Oh, it's it's new media, you know. So all those multimedia consultants could keep on working and you know gaining more money, saying I'm I'm in new media. It's very good and it's very cool and it's very useful for us. Um, during this time, of course, the infrastructural way of, of the internet was really growing. We were drawing a lot of fibers, fiber optics, in the, in the, and we were getting mobile phones, and the first mobile internet connections were starting to appear, and so on. But you know, people were just uh, really afraid. This is just stupid to call this is new media as it is to call it something like postmodern, or it's just a bad way of putting it. Um, and saying that that is really bad. Then we came about just a couple of years ab ago. Uh, you know, probably the consultant didn't earn as much money as it should, so they came up with a with a new term for it. But before we we say that term out loud, I want to show you this was sort of how the web worked uh, back then until a couple of years ago. It was a two-dimensional world. Everything was in height and in width. That's why I put it in bold there. Um, uh, it was working, either an image was height and, and width. We didn't have a third dimension such as depth, or we didn't have a time dimension saying that, you know, I'm here at the same time as someone else. Um, but those kinds of things have changed, and during the last two years, uh, another word has come about, which we use a lot to try to explain what is going on with this thing that we don't really know what it is yet, because we haven't figured out how to pull, plug in all the light bulbs yet. And so the statement is that we, we have said that it's calling us social media, which is probably the largest bullshit I ever heard. You know, it's even worse than new media, because at least in my world, all medias throughout time and history have always been social. You know, we were sitting together around the radios listening to soccer games and, and all that. It was a very social event, event, and we were talking about, you know, those stories on you know, our workplaces and, and different times uh, during the next day and so on. So all stories and all those kinds of things has always been a social part of it. So um, the next time you see this, it's just a very, very b bad name for something. Um, so, but you, know, you can't just stand here and say that this is bullshit, because there are a lot of you know, intelligent and smart people, maybe even chim chimpanzees, saying that this is you know, social media, and I'm the expert in that and this. So I started thinking of, you know, why is it that we feel that this new technologies and the things that are appearing actually feel social? And I came across saying that maybe it has something to do with the spatial understanding of it. Because during the same time, and another word were used a lot in the web, and it was called the real-time web, of how we use the web in, in real time. And I thought about technologies that have been interacting with real-time web before, and it wasn't new either. We couldn't say that you know, real-time was a new thing. Twitter wasn't a new real-time thing, because we had ICQ or MSN for a long time. But why did it actually change something? And, and what was that change? And we had done some you know, really hard experiments trying to get uh, people to understand how the spatial structures, not only height and width, but also in depth, um, you know, because it was a logical step for the web to take, that, okay, what if we give it a third dimension? Maybe that would add something that we hadn't had before to the web. And I was in San Francisco 2006 working with Linden Lab, the guys behind Second Life, for example, who were talking about we we're building a third dimension of the web. Second Life didn't hit, maybe due to technological issues, or maybe due to something else. And here is what I want to mark my point. Because a, a third dimension isn't actually so interesting, uh, because what it ends up doing is, just as the slide I showed before, it becomes very, very, you know, very lonely in Second Life. It became very, where is everybody else? Um, Second Life had another, aspect of it, which was really interesting. It was when there were other people actually around me. And by then, I could actually interact with them. But the third dimension in depth didn't do it. It was time that actually brought the interaction. 
So shouldn't I be able to do this in two dimensions, I was thinking about, and I realized, of course, what if you know, I went into the largest newspaper site, and there was a chat saying that all of the other people around the globe are here at the same time, much more than I can see them. Um, and, and because if I went into Second Life, I could actually, you know, standing and watching, let's say that this was an image of the new article, I could stand there and look at the others and say, oh, you're reading the same article as me. Uh, and then we would start chit-chatting, just as we did, you know, back in the 50s when I went down to the block, you know, picking up the newspaper and looking over my shoulder and seeing, oh, you're reading the same article. And we started discussion, and it was a very social, social thing. But that perspective would never happen if the guy beside me weren't there at the same time as me. If he would have been there 10 minutes earlier or 10 minutes later, that social interaction would have ended. So maybe it is due to all those new infrastructural uh, technologies that we have around us, that we are sort of always connected, because we weren't that a couple of years ago, that makes it feel so social. Maybe we could say that we have added a new layer to the web, a new dimension, which isn't depth, but it's time uh, today. And that, that dimension of time really, really announces a feeling of it being social. Because I'm here together with you as it happens, wherever it happens, and we can interact through that sort of purpose. And we have developed a lot of technologies to do that beside the just two-dimensional web with different kind of chats and different kind of channels where we interact over the same content. Um, and that's about what I'm going to say. So thank you very much for your time, and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>